Welcome to Hope. My name's Stephen. I am the executive pastor of Youth Here. And my name is Sarah, and I'm married to this guy. We are so excited to announce the return of Mission Jamaica for high schoolers and young adults in 2023. If you want to learn more about these great opportunities to serve with your peers and friends, come to our informational meeting Wednesday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. at South Campus and fill out an interest form on our website at fargohope.org slash high school. High school students will be starting our weekly summer bonfires on Wednesdays, June 22nd through August 31st from 7.15 to 10 p.m. at South Campus. Come hang out with your friends, play games, and enjoy snacks. What an awesome way to spend your Wednesday evenings all summer. Thank you so much for joining us today. For more information on all these things happening at Hope, please visit our website at fargohope.org. Good evening. It's so great to see you here. Let's stand and greet one another, and then we'll get started with worship.
worshiping, by singing a thousand hallelujahs. thousand hallelujahs. One of the reasons why God calls us to worship weekly, to give him thanks and praise, is because when our eyes and hearts and souls are focused on Jesus in praise, our attention gets drawn away from the sin, the brokenness, the anxiety, the cares of this world, and life begins to be rightly ordered. And so we worship to honor God, uh, but worship is also good for our souls because it helps us put things in the right perspective. This uh, last couple weeks actually going on right now at our North Campus, but last week here at the South Campus uh, and, and also at our West Campus, we've had over, over a thousand children participating in what we call VBS, VBX, Vacation Bible Experience. We don't call it school because no kid wants to go to school in the summer. And this isn't your grandma's VBS, so uh, we, we rebranded it a little bit. Uh, but, but the kids, they, they worship, they dance, they, they sing. And, and I can't tell you, if you're in this room and there's, there's hundreds of children, 
praising God at the top of their lungs and with all their hearts, it gives you a new perspective about what's really important in life. You know, I confess tonight that, that it's hard to get me there sometimes as an adult today because I got all these things that I worry about. What would everybody else think if I'm singing my heart out and they hear me sing poorly, right? What's, the, what's culturally appropriate? What, I'm worried about the day. I'm worried about what's going on. I'm worried about all these things that keep me from giving my true devotion to God. We're going to take some time right here in worship as, as we worship and praise and as we continue to sing again, a time of silence. And, and whatever it is that's on your heart that's keeping you from giving that heart 100% to him, Confess that to him and ask today for a new heart. And our God, who is faithful and just, will forgive you of your sin, cleanse you from all righteous, unrighteousness, and place a new heart in you. So take that moment today to get right with God. we could never never praise you enough may our lives every day not just tonight but every day be an act of worship help us always Lord to turn our hearts and souls to you and give thanks and remember that you are God that you reign that you are sovereign that you are in control don't let us be sideswiped and distracted and thrown off course by all the pressures, anxieties, and evil of this world. But keep us steadfast in your grace. Forgive us for all those things that we worry about that keep us from having that childlike faith in which we trust you completely. And let us worship you tonight with our whole heart. In Jesus' name. This time we have the great privilege to witness and be a part of the baptism of Emma Jane. Invite her and godparents, family forward, gather behind the font. Today we are celebrating that Emma is not only your child, she is God's child, and because of that, he loves her forever, that nothing in all of creation can separate her from God's love.
Baptism is the beginning of that journey of faith that we have with Jesus Christ, and it is an important thing that we celebrate today. Jesus instructed us to be baptized. In fact, Jesus began his earthly ministry where he began to teach and preach and heal with the baptism. He was baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin, if you remember. And he came to John, and John said to him, I'm not worthy to be baptizing you. You should baptize me. I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. But, but Jesus says, no, we're going to do this so that all order may be fulfilled. Jesus, the perfect one, the holy one, didn't need to be baptized because he was sinless. But what Jesus did in that act of baptism is Jesus, the holy one, made the water clean. He made it holy. It's by his presence and his word. And when he was baptized, it says the heavens were torn open and a voice was heard from heaven that said, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And we know because Jesus was baptized and we're connected to that, that those words become Emma's words today. That God is saying in this gift, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. At the end of his ministry, after Jesus goes to the cross and rises from the grave, the, the resurrection, the ascension uh, into heaven is witnessed by over 500 people. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus gives this command. He tells them to go therefore into all nations, making disciples of them and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, who later comes to faith, he was one who persecuted Christianity, uh, but has a miraculous occurrence, is blinded, and then he's healed, and, and he is baptized. And he writes in Romans that in baptism we are joined to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we believe that baptism isn't simply a, a church ritual. It is, it is an act of God where he is showing up to remind us that his claim is over Emma's life and our lives today through this water and through his holy word. So that's what God is doing in baptism, and that's what baptism is ultimately about. But now also as parents and godparents, you're making some promises. In light of God's promises, you're making some promises in front of this church and in front of God. You're saying to Emma that you're going to raise her to know God's love in Jesus Christ. You're promising to teach her things like the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, the basics of what we believe as Christians, promising to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures and provide for her instruction in the Christian faith, like Sunday school, confirmation, all those things, so that she may lead a godly life until the day of Jesus Christ. And I'd ask you as parents, godparents, do you promise to, uh, to help this little one know Jesus? If so, please say, we do. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the miracle, which is Emma. Thank you for her life. Thank you for the waters of baptism, which claim us for eternity. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us by your promise and give us your grace and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'd ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? If so, please say, we do. And let us all together confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, Emma Jane. It's your time. Okay. Emma Jane, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Emma Jane, child of God, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. You are to let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. Perfect job. Now would you lay a hand on her as parents, godparents, big brother, cousin? We're going to say brother. Okay, we're going to say a prayer. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your sons and daughters from the power of sin and for raising them up to a new life through this holy sacrament. 
Pour your Holy Spirit upon Emma, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Amen. Through baptism, God has made Emma the newest member of the body of Christ that we may proclaim his praise to all the world. Here at Hope, we like to sing a little song, a verse of a little song, to welcome little ones into God's family. Would you please join with me? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And that Bible that tells us so, would you hold that for your sister? All right, you have that one too, I bet, huh? Cool. And let's put our hands together for this newest daughter of the king. Congratulations, you may be seated, and we'll continue with the reading of Holy Scripture. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel today is from the 13th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among, among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen them to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Again, I want to welcome you to Hope and uh, welcome to those that are online with us as well. Uh, we are glad that you are here tonight, and we hope that this worship service is a blessing to you. We're in this sermon series called The Master Gardener, and we wrote this sermon series as pastors because we thought it'd be a fun sermon series based on God's creation, but also because as you read through the Gospels, you see that a lot of the stories, a lot of the metaphors, a lot of the teaching moments that Jesus have has are based on the natural order. They're based on the created order because Jesus was preaching and teaching in a society that was very agrarian, that was tied to the land. And, and those metaphors, those illustrations would have made sense to people. And we thought, well, we live in Fargo. We understand farming in the Red River Valley. We understand those things. And it's a beautiful time of God's creation for us to think about that and in a fun way to engage a summer and learn about how the master gardener, who is God, cultivates and grows and, and roots deep in our life to produce incredible fruit and incredible crop. So, so that's what we're thinking about. So I have to ask you here, who, is anybody here a gardener? A gar like you really love gardening, all, all that stuff. I grew up in a family, my mom, huge gardener, she still is today. Uh, she goes and buys all kinds of flowers and plants and does that. We had a huge vegetable garden, flower gardens, raspberry garden, uh, all this stuff growing up. I'm pretty sure my mom did all that just to make sure we had work to do. As, as kids. As a result of that, I, I love 
all the product of that, love that, uh, all that type of stuff. But one of the things I've recognized in my life, I'm not a gardener. I don't have the patience for it. I'm not very good at it. Uh, but I certainly respect those that do. Uh, but there's incredible, incredible illustrations for faith when we look at the created order. And Jesus in our life, in this parable today, in this story, is talking about one of them. He's telling us that, that the kingdom of God is like this farmer that goes to sow seed. And the seed falls on four different types of soil. And the interesting thing about this parable is this parable is one of the only ones where Jesus tells the parable, but then offers an explanation. He tells the parable, but then very specifically later, tells his disciples what this parable means. And so I want to walk through that and think about what that means in our life. And, and basically to ask this question that Jesus is asking us, and that is, what kind of dirt are you? I don't know if you think about yourself as dirt, but that's what Jesus is asking today. What kind of dirt are you? So in, in verse 19, Jesus has already told the parable, and, and now he gives his disciples the specific explanation of what this parable is about. He says this, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches them away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So the farmer's sowing seed, and some of that seed, because he's throwing it, falls along the hardened path. The path is where the farmer is going every day, walking out to the crop. And what about the path doesn't allow the seed? It's compacted, it's, it's hardened, it's impenetrable. And Jesus says there are some people that their hearts, their souls are like that. For whatever reason in, in this world, the stubbornness of their will, whatever it might be, they are hardened soil. And the word of God is sown, they hear it, but they reject it. And the result of that, the result of that is that the birds come and gobble that seed away. The evil one comes and snatches up the seed, Jesus says, and leads them astray. And I think what we learn from this today, what, what the application I would take from this, is, is heed Jesus' word. If our, if our hearts are hardened to God's word, if, if we have no room for Jesus, and, and by the way, Jesus says in the verse before this that the word is the kingdom of God. It's this kingdom reality that we receive in Jesus Christ, and that we know through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus. So the word is Jesus, and the word is the holy word. It's the Bible. It's the truth of God in Jesus Christ revealed to us in scripture. And so he says, is your heart hardened? Because if your heart is hardened, if you're ignoring God's word, if you're far from it, then you will be led astray, you'll be snatched up by the evil one in this world. But if you are in the word of God, there's incredible protection for this. Is this true? Is this true? Well, there was a, an, a, a, a research organization called the Center for Bible Engagement. They did this big study, called a bunch of Americans, tens of thousands of Americans, and asked them, are you a Christian or not a Christian? And then ask them questions about attitude, about choices, about morality, all those types of things, based on if they read their Bible or not. Interesting, okay? The average American, I think I've heard this before, I'm probably misquoting, owns like two and a half Bibles. I don't know how you own a half Bible, uh, but the average American does. But, but the average American rarely ever reads it. So for most of us, they sit on the shelf collecting dust, sit on the shelf collecting dust, probably holding the other books up, like a bookend or something like that. But the Center for Biblical Engagement asked this question, and, and they looked at a variety of things, and, and they, they looked at non-Christians or people who didn't read their Bible at all, people who said, I read it once in a while. So that means maybe once a month, or, or you know, I heard it in church, or, or, or something like that. And then people who read it daily. And here's what they found is that the people who, who never read it and the people who read it only once in a while, there was no statistical difference or change in their life and what they looked like and they lived like from those people who never read it or weren't Christians. Their lives didn't look any different. But there was dramatic changes in the lives of people who read God's word daily, who read it four or more times a week. And here's some of the changes that they found. That they reported feeling lonely 
dropped by 30%. Anger issues dropped by 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped by 40%. Get this, alcoholism dropped by 57%. Looking at things you shouldn't look at on the internet, this is powerful, dropped by 61%. There's incredible protection in the Word of God. Sharing your faith, jump 200%. Discipling others, jump 230%. So I can tell you up here that it's statistically true. You don't have to just take Jesus' word at it, but it's statistically true if you're in the Word of God daily. There's incredible benefits for your life in terms of morality, and in terms of attitude, perspective, mental health, all of the above. Right? There's protection in the Word of God. Here's the thing. If you're not in the Word of God daily, then I guarantee the culture, the forces of evil, this world, and the perspectives that are not of God are going to win your heart over. They're going to win your heart over. Right? Wherever we're spending the most time being shaped by and influenced by, right? Whatever, whoever's voice is loudest in our life is the one that's going to influence us the most in terms of our values and perspective. So, so Jesus says, right, be aware. Is your heart hardened? Are are you hardened soil? Because if you're on that path, the word of God can't take root in your life. Then he continues in verse 20. He said, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So some of the seed falls on, on rocky ground. And because this ground is, is not really good for soil, it, what happens is the plant has shallow roots. This spring, I was listening to a, a, a radio, talk radio. I shouldn't do that, but I was listening to talk radio. And they had a, a grass-growing expert on the radio. This guy, like his job is just how do you grow your grass really green? So I listen. Here's why. Because I live in a neighborhood, uh, I moved about a year ago, I live in a neighborhood where where everybody's lawns, like it's a competition. How green can we keep our lawns? And people are meticulous about it. But I grew up in a small town in northern Minnesota out in the country. We had lawns, and you just mowed them. You didn't spray them for weeds. You didn't care what grew. It was just an annoying chore to do, right? I mean, like lawn care, that type of thing wasn't anything we thought of. So I thought, well, I better get good at this because I don't want to be, you know, embarrassed in in the neighborhood. So I was listening to this guy. And one of the things that he said is, is if you want your lawn to be really green and be really strong all summer long, is it's important not to cut it too short. Three inches long at the, at the minimum or above. This is this guy, he said this. And the reason is, is because if you cut your grass too short consistently, it doesn't root deep. And if it doesn't root deep, it's not strong. When it gets really hot, like Sunday, it's going to be 105, they say, or something like that, it scorches. It can't withstand it because your grass doesn't have the deep rootedness. Now, that's true of trees. It's true of all kinds of plants. And it's true of our lies. When we're rooted deep, we are stronger. And what Jesus is saying, if you have shallow roots, if you're like that rocky soil and you have shallow roots, when persecution or trouble comes, your faith is going to fall away. He's specific. He says persecution or trouble. Now, as Americans, I don't, I don't think we're often physically persecuted for our faith. There are people in this world still today that are very persecuted physically or not allowed to worship. We, we live in a free country where we're allowed to gather to worship and freely express our faith. But I do believe in our culture today there's a growing intellectual persecution for believing what we believe. And oftentimes it's scary or nerve-wracking for us as Christians to say vocally what we believe because we're afraid that people might dominate that or hijack that with their politics or their other beliefs and, and, and take that away because they're not deeply rooted in the Word of God. They're deeply rooted in their political party, not the Word of God. And that becomes a struggle. The other thing that will happen is if we're shallow-rooted is when persecution or trouble comes. Well, what's trouble? Well, life's going to have trouble. Jesus said that. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Right? When there's, when there's grief, when there's illness, when there's financial struggles, when there's what it stresses at work, all those things. If we are rooted shallow, 
the result will be it will often drive us away from our faith because we don't know who Jesus is. We don't know the God that meets us in those troubles. But if we're rooted deep in God's word, if we're reliant on him, dependent on him, established in him, when those troubles come, oftentimes what I've witnessed in people and what I've experienced in my own life is the roots grow even deeper. Because we know that Jesus came exactly for those times of trouble, that he experienced a time of trouble on the cross and meets us right there with his grace, love, and mercy. And so don't be rooted shallowly. Don't be rooted shallow. I also think this is not only true for us as individuals, but it's true for us collectively. One of the things that I, I really pray about and think about a lot at this church is our roots. If you remember a guy named Pastor Chuck Olmstead, anybody, if you've been around, he was, he was a senior pastor before me. He was intense. I love that guy. He taught me more than, than anybody I'll ever know. I love him. And he's doing well, by the way. He's doing really well. I still talk to him all the time. But Pastor Chuck, I remember one year, he, it was about probably two, three years, he had this question. He said, why? He would he'd go, why? Why is God blessed Hope Lutheran? Why do we have two campuses? Why all this stuff? Why, why, why? And, and of course, being young associate pastors, we would give him all kinds of answers. Well, it's because we're doing this, and that's happening, and all this thing. And he wouldn't accept it. He'd say, why? I don't believe it. I don't buy it, right? So uh, we got smart, and we started asking members of the church, why? You know, why, why do you think this is? And why do you think that is? And I remember one of our founding members, and her and her husband no longer are alive, one of our founding members at Coffee were talking to her, and she said, the reason why is because at the heart of Hope Lutheran has always been lay people, not pastors. She said lay people, and I believe this is 100% true, that are absolutely sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That are on their knees in prayer, in God's word, and sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, we're an outreach church. That means that the, one of the things you'll hear over and over at this place is we do not exist for ourselves. We exist to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in the world. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Shine your light, right? We exist for the person who is not here yet, for the 75,000 people in Fargo-Moorhead who do not go to church ever. That's why we exist. We want to bring them here and help them know Jesus, right? But that's not possible unless the roots of our congregation collectively are deep. And that's why we also focus on the study of Scripture. That's why we have an adult discipleship path that you can go online, where you can grab that and take it and find out where you fit in, what Bible study, what small group, what opportunity exists so that you can root deep. Because if we're not rooted deep as a congregation, then we're not strong. So it's really important that we root deep. I also think this is true for us as a nation, as a people. Having shallow roots as a people is dangerous, is really dangerous. You know, we've seen a lot of unrest, violence, division, hatred in our culture right now. And our response is a very biblical one. Remember Adam and Eve when they ate that fruit that was forbidden to them? The first thing that happened is that they realized that they were naked, so they hid from God. They were ashamed. They hid from the one who created them, the one who loved them unconditionally. But when God found them, what was the first thing that they did? They blamed each other. Adam said, that woman you gave me, God, she made me do it. So fundamentally, he's blaming God and he's blaming his wife, Eve. And I think that's what we see in response to all the hardship and the trouble that we have today. What we see is people pointing fingers, pointing fingers, blaming this group, blaming that person, blaming this person. But see, there's a deeply rooted next level, and that is to get at the heart of the matter of our own sin. Repent of that. And rather than blaming each other, get out and begin to be part of the solution in this world. And one of the things that's true is our nation collectively also has a soul. And if we wander far away from God, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And we see in our culture, in record numbers, people walking away from the church. In record numbers, young people walking away from from the church. In, in large metropolitan areas on the East Coast, West Coast, some cities, less than 3% of people on a given weekend are worshiping. 
There's more non, it's, it's just insane how many people are walking away from the church. If you look at history and you study history, here's one of the biggest myths about Christianity is people say, well, isn't religion the cause of all injustice? You know who started that myth? The Beatles. Imagine all the people. Imagine no religion. Wonderful song to sing. Horrible theology. Absolutely wrong. Do you know what? The worst nations on the world in terms of atrocities, in terms of the death toll, have been secular humanist nations. Stalin's Russia. Hitler's Germany. Pol Pot's Cambodia. Mussolini's Italy. Countries and leaders who didn't believe in God and who led their people towards secular humanistic beliefs resulted in the worst human atrocities on the planet. The worst act of violence and cruelty that this planet has ever seen. Not in the name of religion. In fact, there was a study done and found that less than 8% of all world wars are because of religious issues. They were political, not religious. It's an absolute lie. Don't believe the lie. It's important that we root deep as a people, as individuals, as a church, because the soul of our country depends on this. Deep roots. And then Jesus continues, verse 22. He says, The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it on fruitful. So the next one he says, it sows a seed, it grows up, but the weeds grow with it. Do you know why you pick weeds in a garden? Because your mom tells you to. That's why I did. No. Uh, the reason you pick, pick weeds is because if you allow the weeds to grow, they rob nutrients, they rob moisture, and they may even rob sunlight. They, may, they grow so thick and, and things that the plant can't grow. The plant grows, but it, it doesn't reach its full potential. It doesn't flower. It doesn't bloom. It doesn't bear fruit. It doesn't produce wheat, whatever it is. The weeds take away from the productivity of the plant. Jesus says sometimes the word of God is like that. It, the, the plant grows, but it becomes something distorted, something less than, because the weeds are also there. And then he names the weeds. He says, what are the weeds? The anxieties of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth. Well, certainly the anxieties of this word, world can keep us away from the word of God. We have Bibles. We know how to access them. We have reading plans. You can get a Bible on your smartphone, whatever it is. Well, I'm, I'm so busy. Well, I'm worried about this. I don't have time, right? Isn't it ironic? Jesus is the one that said, come to me, who all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, cast your cares on me. And yet we instead allow our anxieties to drive us away from God rather than to God in complete surrender. The only one that can really help us in that. And then he says also the weeds that can grow up that can choke out the fruit is the deceitfulness of wealth. Listen, he says, he doesn't say wealth, he says the deceitfulness of wealth. Stuff, money in and of itself has no good or bad. It's not good or bad. It's just a thing. Right? The Bible doesn't say money is the root of evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. I think one of the great examples of this is King Solomon. If you remember King Solomon in the Old Testament, he prayed that God would give him wisdom to lead his people. And God saw this as a righteous prayer because it wasn't about him. It was about his people. And Solomon had wisdom. And with his wisdom came a lot of stature. And with his stature came a lot of success. Israel was, was successful. And this wealth followed Solomon. His wealth, he had everything his heart could desire. He lived in the castle. He had every toy. He had everything you could imagine, including a whole lot of wives and a whole lot of concubines. And by the way, the Bible never promotes that sort of marital arrangement. That was in sin. The Bible says that marriage is between a man and a woman. Two people. But Solomon has this. In, in, his, in his older age, his wives steer him away from the one true faith. And he builds temples to these false gods because of his wives. Here's why. Solomon knew what was right. His head knew. He knew the commandments. He knew the first one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. He knew the saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. He knew what was right. He, this was one of the smartest dudes on the planet. Solomon knew what was right, but his heart was led astray. 
And oftentimes faith in our world and obedience to God is not an intellectual problem. We know what's right. You know right now what's right and what's wrong in terms of your life. It's just your heart is distracted by all the stuff of this world. All the shiny baubles and all this other stuff that we stress out and we we chase after in this world thinking that they're going to make us happy, but they only lead to places that are dead ends. And, And the truth of the matter is when you die, you can't take anything with you. Like I've said many times before, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Right? And so what do we do if the anxieties of this world are overcoming and the wealth of this world? If you've set up your life to be only concerned about the bottom line financially in your life and not Jesus Christ, here's what you do. You surrender that to God and let the master gardener come in and do some weeding. And he'll begin to right order your life and prioritize. We confess it to God. And then he says this, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, the good soil is someone who hears God's word and understands it. Understand it means that they've studied it, they've applied it. They're trying to figure out what it means for their life. And when that happens, when we're good soil, when we surrender ourselves to the authority of God, when we understand that the word of God is the final authority in all matters of faith in life, not us, not you and your opinion or your emotions or your feelings, but what God says about this life, here's what he says. It produces a crop a hundredfold times what was sown. Anybody a farmer in here? Is a hundredfold result of, one, of a crop planted pretty good? Yeah, it's miraculous. It's miraculous. Here's the thing. I bet you've heard a sermon before where the preacher is up there saying, you should read your Bible more. Anybody hear a sermon like that before? Yeah, of course, because what else are we going to say? You should. But we miss the point completely if we make, if we, if we, if you walk away from that today in this and you hear, yeah, I'm a, I'm a mess up. I don't read my Bible enough. Pastor Paul's right. I need to, I need to be more disciplined. I need to get that right, you know, because God expects that of me. God wants that of me. Uh, that type of thing. I, I want to tell you this truth. You're missing the point. If you never open up the Bible again, Jesus Christ loves you still. He loves you unconditionally. His love is not dependent on your good works. He loves us so much he went to the cross and died for us and rose from the grave. That's grace. It's a free gift that you have been given. But what Jesus is saying today is that he's offering you a hundredfold result. To get in his word to let that root deep in our lives, to allow that to be established in our lives daily, to surrender to him, will produce the most meaningful, beautiful, protected, amazing life that we could possibly live. And so Jesus is saying, my word, my holy word, it's not a you have to, it's you get to. It's not an obligation. It's pure privilege. It's pure gift. And so we engage in God's word. We we be good soil. We, We allow God's word to root deep in our lives to grow that relationship because the blessing, the fruit of that harvest is amazing. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self control that Jesus can produce in your life is forever. Amen. Father, thank you today for your grace and love and mercy in your son. Guide us, Lord. Help us to be good soil. May your word root deep in our lives, and may our hearts and souls be receptive always, every day, to receive the abundant blessing that you want to give us in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
At this time, we're going to invite our ushers forward to receive this evening's offering, and we're just so grateful to each and every one of you for the gifts that you give to support the ministry and the mission so that all people would know the love of Christ. And as they come forward, we're going to sing this song, Ancient Words, about the Word of God. Father, we thank you today for your holy word. We thank you for the gifts you've given us as a church, Mackenzie and Jared, Lexi and Chris as united in marriage. Thank you for Emma Jane baptized here tonight and all the other children that hope they'll be baptized this week. Uh, thank you for Bruce, uh, Monty, and Mary. And uh, Lord, as they are hospitalized, we ask that you give them your healing. Be with Robin and Carrie Rummel at the death of her son, Mitch and Jamie Colrood at the death of his father. Lord, we pray for our vacation Bible uh, kids. Pray that you're love would root deep in their life. We pray for peace in Ukraine. We, we lift up fathers on this upcoming Father's Day, and we ask that you would use them, bless them. May they turn their hearts to you and serve you always. All these prayers we lift to you, and we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. If we can help you in any way, there'll be somebody at the information desk. Uh, I'll stick around up front. Also, if you need a word of prayer, I'll be honored to pray with you today. Would you please stand as you're able for the final blessing. Our blessing comes from Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We will sing you out. We invite you to go in peace and serve the Lord. Like wildfire. 